Hey Jodie, guess what? What? My son has just learned to ride a bike. No way, so is my son. Well, the big one? No, the little one. Well, the little tiny one? Yeah. He's learned to ride a bike already. How did he get through the manual so quick? What manual? The manual, the how to ride a bike manual. The manual, how to ride a bike, 700 easy steps. You read the manual and then you ride the bike. We didn't use a manual. Well, how did he learn to ride a bike? Do you want to see what happened? Yeah. Just pedal. Just, just pedal. Just keep pedaling. Just ah! <laughs> Right. When my son learned to ride a bike, he actually read the manual first. You don't get on the bike till you're about step 600. Do you want to see Ryan on a bike? There. He's about 20. How long did it take him to read the manual? Well, it took a long time. Maybe 10 years, but he's really now good at riding a bike. So it's easy. I did it that way because that's how I learned to ride a bike. I read the manual, I know it works, so I made him read the manual then got on the bike. If you want my advice, why don't you make your wee guy read the manual first before you put him back on the bike again? Thanks for the advice. Lots of people give me advice, especially when they find out, find out I'm a maths teacher. They give me advice about how I can improve what's going on in my classroom. They give me advice where I should just make sure the kids do lots of practice and procedural work, lots of timetables work, and lots of drill and skill. Well, I've done that before, and I know that at best, that accommodates about five or six students in my classroom. So why do we do that? I'm going to take you to an average maths class. Now I'm an average year seven maths teacher. I've got unit one percentages coming up, but that is not an issue because I've actually got quite a nice unit of work put together for this unit on percentages. I've got lots of nice practice questions. I've got real life examples. I've got some magic YouTube clips. I've got PowerPoints that are really engaging. At the end of the unit, I've written a topic test and I'm going to give the students about three lessons before the topic test so that they can do lots of practice of that test so they've got a chance of actually getting a good score. I go through all that with this average class and the good news is the majority of students pass the test. So I'm actually feeling pretty comfortable that I can send this group of kids on to Year 8. So the following year, I pick up a group of Year 8 students which just happens to be that same cohort of students. We get to middle of the year and it's a unit on percentages and I do a pre-test. And it turns out the students know nothing about percentages. Perhaps it was the teacher they had the year before. But no need, to, no need to worry. I've got lots and lots of good resources. I've got lots of PowerPoint presentations, real life examples. I'm going to do a lot of practice activities with the students. We're going to do a lot of entertaining YouTube clips. And then around about the last three lessons, we'll do some revision before the test. So we go through all that, students sit the test and the majority of students pass. I'm feeling really, really comfortable with what's happened. I'm really happy to send them into the class the next year. So the following year, I end up picking up that same student, those same cohort of students, now in year nine. Get to the middle of the year and we start a unit on percentages. Now I know I've got very little to worry about. I taught those students last year. All I need to do is build on the knowledge that they acquired. So I give them a pretest, and it turns out they know nothing about percentages. Ha, huh, good. How can that be? I can't blame the teacher they had. Now this is a problem we sometimes have, especially as maths teachers. If you can't blame the teacher, who do you end up blaming? And we sometimes are a little bit guilty of blaming the students for not being great learners. Well, if the students are not learning it that way, why do we keep teaching it in that way? And I think part of the problem is that us, we, the maths teachers, we were really successful at learning maths in that way. So we know it works. We've gone through the manual and we've made it work for us. So we repeat that process knowing that it will be successful for people like us. So what we've done at Sunshine College is try to attempt to do something a little bit different where we attempt to teach the concept of the maths rather than the procedure and get to practice procedures. So I'm going to give you an example of what I mean by that. If you look at the area of a triangle, the procedure for teaching the area of a triangle is half the base times the height. Everyone knows that. Everybody uses that. Lots of students can't actually remember half the base times the height. And when they're given different triangles, they don't know which is the base, which is the height, what do I do with them? 
What we do is we focus on the concept of area of a rectangle, which is where all two-dimensional areas come from, and look at the triangle that's inside the rectangle and understand that it's half of that area. The same thing happens with circles. Everything is based on area of a rectangle. So we spend our time teaching the concept, and we allow the students to consolidate that concept, but we don't give them lots and lots of procedural practice. And what we found is teaching the concepts can be more powerful than teaching the procedures. So why don't we do it more often? Why don't we teach the concepts rather than the procedures? And there's generally two reasons why we do teach the concepts over the procedures. And the first of those is time and the second is uh, teacher capacity. Some teachers don't understand the concepts behind uh, some of the basic mathematical uh, procedures out there or concepts out there. But that's easily rectified through things like peer observations or support from their um, colleagues or professional development. The more difficult one to tackle is time. All schools suffer from that same problem, regardless of what method you teach. It's very hard for a school or a teacher to get through all of the content that they need to in the allocated time. In mathematics, that is an issue when you're concentrating on introducing a procedure then you have the students doing lots and lots of practice activities. And during that time, you're hoping that they'll get to the concepts, or if you do have a little bit of extra time, you'll introduce the concepts at the end. What we're saying is, introducing the concepts to begin with, then the students do a lot of consolidating work on those concepts. So foregoing practice and procedural work and concentrating on the concepts. And what you end up with, students understanding mathematical concepts and having a greater enjoyment for the subject. And let's face it, as teachers, that's not a bad thing. That's what we want. Classrooms full of students who are engaged and who are learning. Now, we started off this talk with a slightly clumsy metaphor, uh, and it was at the expense of one of my children. He actually can ride a bike and could ride a bike when he was five. So um, that's a nod to him. That's my disclaimer. Thank you for posing as a student who could only just ride a bike. Uh, but more importantly, how is Harry actually going? Has he ridden a bike yet? Well, let's see what happens. <laughs> I so wanted him to crash right into you. <laughs> and that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you.